Good morning. So wonderful to be here together today. And uh, you know, we live in a day and age where uh, there is a lot of things happening in our world. And in that regard, things are changing so rapidly and so quickly. So we actually do want to talk about a few things that's happening in our culture, as I was thinking how to turn this thing on. So this past week when I was thinking about what it is that I want to share, certain thoughts came to my mind, and I really want to share them with you, because even as Brian mentioned, things are happening so fast in our world, and things are changing so rapidly, and we need to be really alert about what's going on. Uh, you may recall back way when, when we were studying, uh, going through the kingdom of God, we looked at some passages in the book of Daniel, and specifically in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel had a vision of four beasts coming out of the water. And those four beasts represented four consecutive kingdoms that would come upon the earth. He saw a lion, he saw a bear, he saw a leopard, and then the fourth beast was so dreadful and awful that he couldn't even name it. The only thing that he could name it was that it was dreadful. And that four beasts represented the kingdom of Rome. And that particular beast, according to Daniel chapter 2, has two stages. The earliest stage, which happened early on in the history, and the second stage that is yet future to us. That particular beast had ten horns, and while he was looking, then he saw a little horn coming up in the midst of him, uprooted three of those horns, and had a mouth speaking arrogant words. So he's wondering about what all that is about, and he asked one of the presumably angels that was next to him in the vision what the meaning was. So we're going to pick up on that meaning. He says that then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely, that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering, great boast, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them, until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus, if I can move this forward, Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. So what he was talking about in this vision, that at the end of the time, there is going to be a period of time in history that is yet future to our time, but it is on the horizon very much so. That the whole world is going toward a one world government. The world as a whole is going to be divided up into 10 regions. Each region is going to be 
run and ruled by a particular individual, a leader, and from amongst them, there is going to be another one that's going to come up which represents the Antichrist or the better yet, counterfeit Christ. Antichrist is not going to be someone that's going to come and say, I'm against Christ. He's going to actually counterfeit claiming to be Christ. And that's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 told his disciples, he said, see to it that no one will deceive you for many will come saying that I am he will deceive many. So that is the deal that is going on here. And we are so fast approaching that period of time. And the angel goes on, he said, he will speak out against the Most High, and this is the Antichrist, or counterfeit Christ, and we're then the saints of the highest one, and he will be intent to make alteration in times and in laws They will be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. So that is three and a half years. So the word of God tells us about the seven years of tribulation that is yet ahead. And the last three and a half years is referred to as the great tribulation. And that is when it is going to be given into the hands of the counterfeit Christ. He said, but the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the domain, and the greatness of all kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. Now, Apostle John, in the book of Revelation, picks up on this, and specifically in Revelation chapter 13, Apostle John tells us about the beast that's going to come out of the water, and that is the counterfeit Christ. And this counterfeit Christ is going to have a sidekick referred to as the false prophet. False prophet is going to do a lot of things for Antichrist. He's going to have basically a position of False Holy Spirit, if you will. How Holy Spirit draws the attention of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. False prophet will draw the attention to the beast. And he's going to cause everyone to worship him. Now, in Revelation chapter 13, John, if you would please advance that. He's talking about this false prophet. It says, and it was given to him, meaning to the false prophet, to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all the small and great and the rich and the poor and the free and the slaves to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. Technology, anyone? This is already happening in Europe, that they are giving chips to people under their skin so they can be traced down, tracked down. And it provides a lot of social benefits, supposedly. Verse 17 says, and he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And it goes on and tells us about the famous verse that everybody knows. Here's the wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Now, why do I mention that? I just mention that because of where we are heading. If I can move this forward. All right. So, last week... Here is what was on the news. It says future is digital. EU chiefs calls for global digital IDs and new UN body to govern artificial intelligence. Here's what she says. The world needs 
international digital ID system like coronavirus passport and artificial intelligence should be regulated by a global body similar, listen to this, similar to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said on Sunday. So what they are proposing in Europe, that because now that we have inter, in, uh, basically artificial intelligence, that that is the right time for everybody to have an ID so they can track it down. Fortunately, when the coronavirus happened, they wanted to implement the passport in the United States. There was a lot of resistance on the part of American people, and it didn't happen. But that was a dry run about what's yet to come. And she goes on further and tweets, or now they call it X. And in that, this is from her Twitter account or X account. It says the future is digital. I passed two messages to the G20. Now, who are the G20? The G20 are the leading economies of the world, the countries, right? She passed the message to them. And you can see her sitting here next to Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau. And she said, number one, we should establish a framework for safe, responsible AI. Yeah, right, right? safe and responsible, responsible to the elite, not to you and I, with a similar body as that of IPCC for climate. IPCC is that intergovernmental panel on corona, on the rather uh, climate change. And then she goes on, says, digital public infrastructure are an accelerator of growth. You see how they're going to sell it? This is going to really help business. It's going to really cause growth, right? They must be trusted. That sounds wonderful. Who wouldn't want something that is trusted, right? But it's not going to be trusted by you and me because we wouldn't know what's going on. It must be trusted, interoperable, that is for sure it's going to be interoperable because it's going to be worldwide. This, once this is started, they, are, they have already implemented this in countries like China. So the EU and the US are following the steps of China. Interoperable and open to all. Well, that all, I tell you, is not including you and me. That all includes to all the elites that are controlling. Now, how is that going to come about? Well, the way that's going to happen, you're going to have to have an economic disaster of some sort, and you're going to have to have wars. Generally speaking, people are willing to render and submit their own liberty and freedom for the sake of security. If people don't have economic security, they'll do whatever the government says. If there are wars and there is chaos and there is no security in our houses, we'll be very much willing to give up of our freedom in order for somebody to bring order. That's just the human nature. That's what history shows, right? So here is the news that was on Yahoo. It says, NATO in 2024 to conduct biggest military exercise since Cold War in Germany, Poland, and Baltics. Is it prelude to a world war that's coming? The Lord Jesus said that you shall hear of the wars and rumors of war, for the nations shall rise up against nations and kingdom against kingdoms, and there will be earthquakes in various places but the end is not yet. So we are heading that way, folks. And I just want you to be alert. Now, in terms of economic front, there are news every day that, that you can see. They have been trying to make the economy go into recession for past two years. 
Well, what's the purpose of that? Who wants that? Well, they say that because we want to bring inflation down. But that's not the real reason. The reason they want to have recession to come because recession destroys middle class. The problem that exists in this country is because middle class is a strong. Fortunately, they have tried everything and American economy has been very resilient. The poor is dependent upon government. No problem. The rich are in cahoots with government. There is no problem. It is only the middle class that are independent and they conduct small businesses, they create wealth, they create jobs. So if they can bring the middle class to its knees, well, then all problems in their mind is solved. Now, I only just mention that just to bring it to your attention. So what are we to do? As the Bible says, since we know these things are happening, how shall we live in holy conduct, praying to the Lord? We're going to have to examine our hearts. If there are known sins in our lives, we need to deal with that. We need to live a holy and righteous life before the Lord because the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Remember what James says about Elijah. He says he was a man like you and I, but he earnestly prayed, and for three and a half years, it did not rain. How do you like that kind of a prayer? Pray and you hold reign for three and a half years. How many people is affected? A lot of people. What I'm saying is that prayer of a righteous man changes the course of history. What, is, has, what has been told, what has been prophesied is going to take place in history, yet our prayers can affect the course of history. Not the results. It's going to delay Perhaps all these events taking place for a while, giving opportunity to our loved ones and the other people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ to come to knowledge of him, saving knowledge of him, that we are looking for rapture, that one day our Lord would come and call us home. But... The rapture is not going to happen, and then all these things hundreds of years later. There is a very short period of time between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. Something that it is actually both of them are imminent. That when the rapture happens, that the tribulation can start. So we need to be vigilant, we need to be in prayer, and we need to live a holy conduct. Now, there has been many of time in history of mankind where people, where man, has lost the opportunity of recognizing the hour of visitation. Just think about the flood of Noah. 120 years Noah preached. 120 years. That was a window of opportunity for people to repent. They didn't. What happened? Flood came, destroyed them all. Look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The two angels come, and they tell Lot, get all your family out of here because the Lord is going to destroy it. He goes and tells his family and tells his future son -in to be son-in-laws. And what do they think? They think he's just joking. What happened? They missed that opportunity. And what happened? They got destroyed in the process. Think about Exodus. Here comes God and telling people, telling everybody that after the nine miracles and signs that he gave them, that he's going to give you one more sign that you should put blood by faith, on the doorpost of your house. And the angel of death is going to pass you by. That was an opportunity. 
for Egyptians, for all the Jews alike. They missed that opportunity. And those that didn't take that opportunity, they lost their firstborn. And just think of the nation of Israel. They are in the wilderness. They have come, and God says, I want you to go and take the land by faith. They had an opportunity to go by faith into the promised land. But they got afraid. They didn't trust the Lord. And what happened? For 40 years, they were in the wilderness. And that generation died in the wilderness, and they never saw the promise that God had given them. Now, Brian also was talking about, you know, just some thinking just about opportunity. Next week, we do have an opportunity to vote for a pastor. Like he said, there has been a year. In fact, in one week, there is a year that we haven't had a pastor. The Lord has blessed us in this church. We haven't been left wanting, but times are different. Things are different. Things are changing very rapidly. So we're going to have an opportunity next week to vote. And getting back to the book of Acts, there was an opportunity that the nation of Israel lost. Their savior had come, the one who was going to establish the kingdom. So one week before, when the Lord Jesus approaches Jerusalem, Luke 19, verses 41 through 44 says this, When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which makes for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the day will come up upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Folks, let me tell you, God expects people, his people, to know the times of visitation. God wants us to be alert about what is going on in history. God wants us to be on our knees in prayers before him because this is the time of his visitation that it is coming. So the nation of Israel, they missed that opportunity. They missed the kingdom. And there was a judgment that was called upon them. So. 40 years from the time that we are studying from this day of Pentecost, the Romans, under the leadership of Titus, they came in, they destroyed Jerusalem, killed over a million people, mothers and infants and pregnant women, and so gruesome of what happened that they could have avoided it. So that brings us to the day of Pentecost. So these people that are there on the day of Pentecost, just about two months earlier, they had missed the boat. They were there, they stand at the foot of the cross and they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. However, God in his mercy and grace, giving them another chance because God doesn't want that his people to perish. So, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, fills the apostles, and they began to speak in an unknown human language, unknown to them. They were not educated in it. They were not trained in it. And there were other people that were from different parts of the world, and they heard, and they were amazed at what's going on with all these languages that you are hearing, which is their own native tongue. And Peter stands up and he gives a eloquent first evangelistic message in the Old Testament. He told them about the Joel prophecy and then he goes on and said, Men of Israel, listen to this word. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God 
with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourself know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So now they were held responsible. Now, there are many people have used this verse to really promote anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is demonic. And while these first century Jews, they were held responsible because of the death of Christ and because of his crucifixion, yet you see here it says this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And we talked about that last week. Then he goes on, he says, but God raised him from the dead, putting putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And somebody would say, well, that's wonderful, Peter, but why do you say that? What's your proof? What are you talking about? So now he's going to go on and give them reasons from the Old Testament. So he says, is Acts chapter 2, verse 25. He says, because David said of him. Now, if you go and you look at, this is a quote from uh, Acts chapter, I mean, from Psalms chapter 16. You are not going to see the name of Christ there. But here, Peter says, David says of him. Well, how do you know, Peter, that is David talking about Messiah, because in this passage, in Psalm, there is no mention of Messiah. Well, this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They have been filled with the Holy Spirit, and they can see things and understand things that we cannot. You and I cannot go into the Old Testament, pick at a certain passage, and say, well, this is talking about... Messiah. Some of it we do know, but some of it we do not. But the Lord Jesus Christ said that the whole Old Testament speaks of him. The rabbis were talking about Messiah. When the Messiah come, not only he will tell us about every word, he will tell us about the spaces between every word. He will even explain the spaces between the lines of what it means. That was their belief. And the Lord Jesus Christ will explain all of that one day. So he goes on, he says, David says, I saw the Lord continually before me because he is on my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue was overjoyed. Moreover, My flesh also will live in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So Peter's response, Peter's proof, is the fact that it was spoken of an individual that will not be abandoned in Hades, and his body will not see decay. Now, what does it mean by Hades? Well, if we go to Luke, which is another book that Luke wrote in addition to Book of Acts, you know, when you, when you read the Bible, you have to read it in the context. The context doesn't simply mean the immediate verses adjacent to the verse you are studying. Yeah, that is important. So you read the Bible in the context of immediate verses, in the context of immediate chapter, in the context of the book, in the context of the other books by the same author, and then in the context of New Testament or the Old Testament. So Luke has written two volumes, 
the Gospel of Luke, and also the book of Acts. So in the Gospel of Luke, he is the only one that tells us about what Hades is. Is it just a coincidence that the book of Acts, talking about Hades? Well, how do we find out about what Hades is? So Luke chapter 16, the Lord Jesus told of a story. There is a difference between a story and a proverb. So what I'm reading you is not a proverb. It is actual and a story, a historical event. Well, so how do you know that? Because he tells us about a name of a person. When there is a proverb, usually you don't have a name of an individual. You just have a story about whatever you want to talk about. It says, now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, enjoying himself in a splendor every day, and a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores. See, that's how you know this is actual story, because he's naming the one that was laid at his gate. And longing to be fed from the scraps which fell from the rich man's table, not only that, that the dogs also were coming and licking his sores. Now it happened that the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And now it goes on and says that in Hades, he opened and raised his eyes. This is the rich man. Being in torment, and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. So now he's telling us about Hades. So Hades, on one side, we see that there is a Abraham's bosom, and then there is another side that has torment. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Does that tell you something? This guy really knew who this fellow was that was laid at his gate. He never fed him. He was waiting for the crumbs, things that the dog would eat. And dogs would come and take care of his sores. He was no good Samaritan. So he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in flames. That creates a lot of questions. What happens to people when they die? When we die, our spirit doesn't go in a purgatory. It doesn't go in a holding place. According to this, there is some sort of a temporal body that it is given because this man is feeling pain. Now, there are debates about exactly how that temporal body is. Some believe that this happens, actually, maybe at the resurrection. But we don't know for sure. We know that this guy had a body. We know that he has his cognitive devices. He recognizes Abraham. I don't know how he recognized Abraham. I think he was wearing a name tag, but that's subject to debate. And he knew Lazarus. So he says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. That's interesting, right? He's in an agony, and now he's looking for mercy. Now there is an understanding. There is an understanding when we are on the other side of life. It's not going to be, gee, well, God, I didn't really know. Well, God, you know, if you had only done this, I would have come to know you. He knows exactly what is going on. He's asking for mercy because he knows where he is and what he deserves. Let me tell you, folks, there is only salvation 
in one person, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one blood that washes our sins, and that is blood of Christ. You know, oftentimes people talk about, and they say, well, I don't need to. I've talked to Muslims, and they say, I don't need, I don't need Christ dying for me. You know, I just do good work myself. They think that they have good works. The Bible says that we have none, not even one. He says there is no one that is righteous, not even one. All of our good works are like filthy rags. And I'm, I apologize to mention this here to you, but the word that it is used for filthy rag is actually menstrual cloth. It is full of deadness. So what is that the Lord Jesus Christ is doing? Well, let me tell you. You know, nowadays there is a lot of talk. You hear about Elon Musk and others that are trying to send spacecrafts to go orbit the Earth with the goal of maybe one day people can travel to moon. Well, if you are going to go and travel to moon and you walk on the surface of the moon, what do you need to have in order for you not to get destroyed? Well, you need to have a moon suit. So now, suppose, for the sake of argument, suppose you want to travel to sun. Now what do you need to have? You need to have in a spacecraft that it is not going to melt by the heat of the sun. You need to have a suit that be able to withstand the heat and the radiation. So you would need to have a sun suit if there is such a thing. Well, that's exactly what it is. God is so holy and righteous that if you and I are going to go in his presence, it is like us wanting to go to sun. We need to have a sun suit. And that sun suit is the righteousness of Christ. It is not that God is an ogre and he wants people to perish. Bible says that God is patient and he wants all to come saving knowledge of Christ. But would all? No. Why not? Because God had given us liberty. He has given us our volition. We can make decisions. So Jesus Christ said, he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to judge the world, but rather that the world might be saved through him. So the Lord Jesus Christ holds away the wrath of God from you and me. And he becomes a shield and he gives us his righteousness. So there is no other salvation. There is no other name under heaven given unto men by which they can be saved except that of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the man says in Hades, he raised his eyes being in torment and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. Cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. And then Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you receive your good things. Now, what would he call him? Child. Well, this guy happened to be a Jew. He knew Father Abraham. So in terms of genealogy, he was a child of Abraham. But not in his faith. And likewise, Lazarus had bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. Now, this verse doesn't say that the people who are suffering in this life are going to be automatically saved. That is not what this verse says. He says he had his own bad things events in life, his misery, and you had your luxury. But Lazarus had faith. He believed in God. 
He was poor. He was needy. He was sick. But he believed in a creator God. On the other hand, the rich man didn't. You know, the Lord Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man come to saving knowledge of Christ. That doesn't mean rich people cannot believe him. The point that he's making is something that we all know. Money solves a lot of problems. We all know that. We know that in our life. When you don't have money, that's when you start praying to God. If you can spend money and solve a problem, we do it. We don't come usually to God and pray about it. We just spend the money and take care of whatever. If you need a car, you just go buy a car. But if you don't have car and your car breaks down, now you start praying, Lord, help me. So there is, it's not that money is the issue. In fact, Bible doesn't say anything about money. It says the love of money is the root of evil, not money. There is nothing wrong with money. God blesses his people. During the time of Solomon, God had given them so much wealth that they didn't even count the silver. They just heaped it up. So God is not the one holding back from people having wealth. In fact, God blesses his people. But if we don't have money, that doesn't mean we are not blessed. That was the case of Lazarus. So Abraham goes on. He said, now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set. So that those who want to go over from here to you will not be able nor will any people cross over from there to us. Now, isn't that amazing, right? People that are in hell, they can look across and see what's going on. You know, everybody at some point of time in the future, when we stand before God, is going to receive a resurrected body. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody that has been born of a woman on this planet, we are not going to be annihilated. We will be living for eternity in a spiritual body, either with God or away from God. So every one of us here have a destiny. That's a visitation with the Lord. And that's really awful, because once a spiritual body is given to you, you can feel pain and sorrow, agony, and that goes on forever and ever. That is awful, folks. That is why we pray for our loved ones. That is why we pray for the people that we know. Because alternative is so awful, it is unimaginable. The alternative is such that God sent his son to cross. On the cross of Calvary for three hours, it was darkness. Because what happened to Jesus Christ was so awful, God didn't want anyone to see. For the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. He did not become a sinner, but he became sin. So wrath of God came upon sin and judged sin for eternity. Nobody's going to stand before God and says, hey, you know, I'm okay, fine, I'm going to go to hell, and I'm going to pay for my sins. He says, no, the issue of sin is done with. Jesus Christ paid for all humanity's sin. But that doesn't mean that everybody goes in the presence of God. Why is that? Because in order for you to be in the presence of God, to be a believer, three things need to happen. You need to have your sins washed away. You need to have a new spirit. And you need to have the righteousness of God. Only righteousness of God can have fellowship with God. So yes, the issue of sin is dealt with. 
But there now remains the other two things. New spirit and righteousness of God. And that only happens by faith. By faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what do we mean when we say faith in Jesus Christ? As you have, may have heard me say in the past, Muslims believe in Jesus. They believe that he was a prophet. They believe that he was born of a virgin. They believe that he lived a sinless life. They even believe that he was resurrected, he went to heaven. What they don't believe is his death on the cross. For without shedding of the blood, there is no remission of sin. So what do they believe? They believe that in the last moment, God pulled a trick on people. He made Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, to look like Jesus and put him on the cross so people crucified Judas and Jesus went up to heaven. Well, what, why do they say that? That's such a bizarre story. Well, because Islam, like any other religions with that exception, has to do with the good works of man. That if you do have enough good works, you can be accepted by Allah. But Christianity is not a religion. Religion is man's way of wanting to reach to God, which is an impossibility. Christianity is the way of life. It is God who condescends to the level of mankind. For it is his humility that is saving you and me. So the man says, the rich man, he said, then I request of you that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment as well. Now we find something else. This guy has either a love for his brothers, he has feelings for them, he is concerned for them. But now at a different place. You see, what I'm saying is that when people die, all the things that we go through now, it is there. It doesn't get done away with. So he says, I have five brothers in order that they may, that he may warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment as well. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, they need to have faith. It's not by works. Oh, he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Isn't that what happened with the Jews? Jesus Christ rose from the dead, but they didn't believe him. Why didn't they believe him? Because they didn't believe Moses and the prophets. The Lord Jesus Christ told Nicodemus, he said, if I tell you of the earthly things and you don't believe, how are you going to believe about the heavenly things? Well, what are the earthly things? Earthly things are the things that can give you and me empirical data. We can go and read the Old Testament and see about the prophecies that God has put there. And then we can look forward to see if they have been fulfilled. So now, here is God. For 4,000 years, he has spoken. He has told us. He has recorded the events of history for us. And we can look in history. Did the things that he talked about have come to fruition? And if it does, now the God that has told me something, and for 4,000 years he has been able to bring it to fruition, well, he is God because he is beyond time and space. Now, 
One of the things that's actually very interesting is that people really don't want to believe. It's not that they don't have evidence, they don't have data. Look at the nation of Israel. We talked about that last week. How is it that nation of Israel is still in existence? You don't have in history any nation that went out of existence and have come back again. Where are the Hittites? Where are the, where are the South American kingdoms that were here? Aztecs, what are they? Once they went out, they went out. God evicted them from the earth. Nation of Israel has gone out of existence as a nation, not once, but twice. And they have come back as a nation. Last one in 1948. So, what is Hades? The Old Testament word for it is Sheol. Sheol has basically three parts, three compartments, if you will, to it. That is the bosom of Abraham. And what happened with the people that they were in the bosom of Abraham? Ephesians 4, verse 8 tells us that when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he went down and took the people that they were in the bosom of Abraham with him to heaven. So that's why the Bible says he descended and he took captivity captive. So he took everybody that was in the bosom of Abraham to heaven with him. But there is also another compartment, as we read, it's the area of torment. And that is what we were just reading. That is where the rich man was. Then there is another compartment, it's referred to as outer darkness or Tartarus. In 2 Peter, it tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ, after he was crucified, he went into the other darkness and he preached to the spirits that they were held prisoners. Now, who are these spirits? These spirits were the spirits that during the time of Noah, these angels, if you will, they commingled with mankind. For Bible tells us that the son of God, son of sons of God, they saw the daughter of mankind and they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves. That is a bizarre thing, isn't it? How can angels come and cohabitate with women? Well, Bible says that they left their own abode. The word that is used for abode, it talks about where they were dwelling. Some think it is heaven. That happened. But it is talking about something else. They shed whatever spiritual bodies they had and they took on form of a man. And they cohabitated with women. And they had offsprings that are referred to as Nephilim. So once the flood of Noah came and destroyed everybody, God took all of these spirits and put them in the place of outer darkness in Tartarus. So when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, prior to that, he went to Tartarus and he made a proclamation to these spirits that are in custody, that are in chains. Well, what was that proclamation? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but we can surmise, we can come to a conclusion that he told them, well, listen, folks, the things that you tried to do, it didn't happen. Now, what was it that they were trying to do? Well, God had said to Adam and Eve, 
And he has told Satan as well, he told Satan that I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Her seed will crush your head, and your seed will bruise his heel. So when Satan finds that out that's the case, he said, oh, so that is great. All we have to do is mess up the gene pool of mankind. Now, if the gene of mankind is messed up and it is corrupted, seed of the woman cannot come because he must be a human. He knew that only a man can die for another man. You know, one of the things that baffles people is that why do we have a savior that we say that he is God and he's man? Why do we need to have a savior that has to be God and has to be man? Well, let me tell you, only a creator knows what are the requirements of a creator. Let me give you an example. During the time of Noah, God told Noah that I'm going to destroy the whole earth, build an ark. Suppose he left it there. What kind of an ark would Noah build? He had no idea. There was no rain. He had never seen a flood. Doesn't even know what a boat is, maybe. Or maybe they did. But doesn't know what to build. So God gave him the dimensions of the ark. Because the ark needed to carry not only Noah and his family, but also the animals. So why did God give him the dimensions? Because only the creator knows what kind of a storm he's going to send, and only he knows what kind of a boat can resist that kind of a storm and survive. That is why we have a creator, God, that became like man. So, only God knows what satisfies his wrath. Angel doesn't know because they don't know the depth of God. Only Jesus Christ, for being the creator himself, knows the depth of God. So on one side, the one that is coming knows the requirement of God. On the other side, he has to be like you and me. He couldn't have been an angel, couldn't have been another creature, couldn't have come from Mars had to be like you and me. Now, one of the things, in fact, we were talking about it on men's meeting. By the way, you know, we have Tuesday nights, we have men's meeting. We are studying Gospel of John. It's a really good time for you men to come. We talk about a lot of things. What we were talking about, what is this whole thing about the Son of God? When we think of the Son of God, We are not talking about somebody that is born of God, per se, as in terms of genealogy. But the Bible uses the word son in three different ways. One is that it talks about the same rank, the same identity. So Old Testament talks about the sons of the prophet, sons of the musician. doesn't mean that their fathers were prophets or musician, but that means they were prophets and they were musicians. So it is in the same rank. Another way that the son is used, of course, is that in terms of genealogy. Another way that the son is, the word son is used, it explains character, it refers to bar. Barnabas as the son of encouragement. It refers to James and John as the sons of thunder. Talking about their character. 
So when we are talking about son of God, we are talking about what his character is and who he is being God himself. So then getting back to Acts, Peter goes on, he says, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God has sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And here is a verse in the Old Testament that talks about who David really was, not only just as an individual. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 1 through 3, it says, Now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares... Remember what Peter said. Peter said that he knew he was a prophet. Well, how do we know he was a prophet? Well, look at this. He says, he says, David, the man who raised on high declares the anointing of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. He says, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. So he was a prophet. But don't get mixed up, somebody that is a prophet, with having an office of a prophet. Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they had the office of the prophet. But Daniel was a prophet, but he didn't have the office of a prophet. That was different. And then... If I can move this forward... In 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 12 and 13, God's promise to David. These are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares, the man who was raised on high declares, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of arms, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was on my mouth. And he goes in 2 Samuel, when your days are complete, and that is the promise, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendants after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So Peter goes on and finishes this, and with that, we're going to wrap it up. So Peter says, that David, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we all are witnesses. Therefore, having, built, having been exalted to the high hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of Holy Spirit, he has put forth this which you both see and hear. So you remember how it all started. They began to speak in other tongues, and the people that they were listening, they said, what does this mean? And that is the conclusion that Peter is coming. He said, the reason that you hear what you hear, the reason that you, in your, with your own ears, hear the languages that these apostles didn't know, was because God's promise was given that he would raise up somebody on the throne of his father, David. Well, let me tell you, folks, David is not, I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ right now is not sitting on the throne of David. What does the book of Revelation tells us? He says he's sitting on the throne of his father, throne of David is going to be on earth. So when he comes back to establish his kingdom, the thousand year rule of his kingdom, he will be sitting on the throne of his father, ruling the whole planet from Jerusalem. That's what we read in Daniel chapter 7.
Let's close with a word of prayer. Eternal God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, how blessed we are that we have been known by you, that you have revealed to us your Son, Jesus Christ, that you have given us, Father, the gift that we have, for by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of our own works that any man should boast, but a gift from your hand. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the blessings that we have in this country, the liberty and freedom that we still enjoy. Lord, we pray that you make us sensitive to your calling, to your leading, that, Father, we may be pleasing in your sight, that in all things we may bring honor and glory to you. We pray for our leaders, Lord. Give them wisdom. Give them understanding. Put the fear of God in their heart. Thank you, Father, for we love you and we adore you, for it is in Jesus' name that we all pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.